Uh, without further ado, um, of course, many of you will know Ivo Patel from uh, previous engagements here at Northwestern, but just in case, he's a member of President Barack Obama's Advisory Council on Faith Based Neighborhood Partnerships. He's also founder and president of the Interfaith Youth Corps, a Chicago based international non profit uh, organization that aims to promote interfaith cooperation. Um, he's a local boy, fair to say. Um, got his bachelor's degree at the University uh, of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. And then, as a Rhodes Scholar, he went on to Oxford University, where he's got his doctorate in sociology as well, so sociology of religion, to be precise. Um, so, a uh, very interesting scholarly career, as well as one that deals with a very important topic. I think we're all aware of the uh, divisions or alleged divisions between religions that have emerged in the uh, contemporary period. Um, and, of course, this initiative um, that Dr. Patel is engaged in is of critical importance in trying to bridge these alleged divisions. So without further ado, uh, I would say please join me in welcoming Dr. Patel. After the talk, he's also available for signing his book, Sacred Ground, which is available at the back. Um, and I plan to um, call the, uh, the meeting around 7.20, so we'll have some time to talk to you one-on-one -on -one and sign the book. Uh, until then, we'll give about 40 minutes of a lecture, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. Okay? All right. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patel. Hello. Uh, I love being on college campuses in the fall. I'm walking with Professor Goodman along the lake, uh, uh, down Sheridan Road, and I'm thinking to myself, there's, there's no place better than you know, these big towering trees, all the leaves are changing colors, and the special deliciousness of this is that I wasn't smart enough to get into this place when I was in high school. So I always take like special pride in uh, speaking at places that my parents really wanted me to go to when I was graduating. <laughs> so here I am, my, you know, my dad, whenever I speak at a business school or a medical school, will always grumble underneath his breath, I wish you were in the seats instead of on stage, you know, getting, getting that medical degree. Here I am, uh, uh, a mild disappointment to my parents as founder and president of Interfaith Youth Corps. Um, uh, that's a joke. I hope that they don't actually watch this on YouTube. Um, but I, I want to tell you how this starts for me. Um, and it actually starts in college. Uh, it, in 1995, when uh, a professor of mine hands me an article in the Atlantic Monthly by a guy named David Bornstein. That might be a familiar name to folks who've read his book, How to Change the World. Uh, and it was an article on a guy named Muhammad Yunus, who was probably also a familiar name to folks here. He uh, is the founder of the Green Bank and the movement of microfinance and the winner of the Nobel Peace Prize six or eight years ago. But back in 1995, nobody had heard of him, including me. So I'm reading this article about how this Bangladeshi Muslim comes to the United States, gets the PhD in economics from Vanderbilt University, goes back to Bangladesh, becomes the chair of the economics department at the University of Chittagong uh, in, during the early 1970s when there is a famine in Bangladesh, and he watches people come literally from the village into the city and pass from life into death. They starve to death. And at some point he thinks to himself, you know, I can't stomach the fact that I am giving lectures in hoity-toity economic seminars on the law of supply and demand and how you get scarce resources to important places when the most important resource in the, in the world, food, is not getting to the most important place, which is people's bodies, right? So he begins to investigate this a little bit more, and he goes to a number of villages in, uh, in Bangladesh, and he, he discovers that there's a solution to the problem of starvation. And the solution is giving people the opportunity to start their own small businesses. Uh, and the big problem is that there's a lack of lending to individuals and small groups of people in villages. There's a lack of what he starts to call micro-lending. And he goes to a bunch of his friends who are bankers, and they literally laugh at him. And they say, do you really think that we would lend to Muslim women in villages to weave baskets to sell on the market? You must be kidding. And Muhammad Yunus, which, uh, who had you know, a reasonable amount of, of a screw you within him, you know, which I admire, frankly, was like, basically, screw you, I'll start it myself. That's the Grameen Bank. And I'm reading this story. And I don't have a particular interest in economics, but I'm fascinated with how this guy looks at a social problem, creates a solution, and then doesn't just write a book on the solution starts the institution that solves the problem, the Grameen Bank. 
and thinks, first of all, how does this get into villages in Bangladesh, and when it's successful there, spreads it throughout South Asia, and when it's successful there, spreads it throughout the developing world. And now it's actually in New York, right? And David Bornstein uses in this article a term to describe Muhammad Yunus, what I'm calling an identity category, which is a bit of a cumbersome term for now, but we'll hang with it for the moment, calls him a social entrepreneur and says what social entrepreneurs do is they identify a problem in the society. They don't, just, they don't just analyze the problem. They don't just illuminate the problem. They don't just write a book about the problem. They build an institution or a movement to solve the problem. And honestly, I slept better that night because I thought to myself, I finally have an identity category for myself, right? I fit kind of uh, not quite perfectly in the identity category of future lawyer, which is probably the path I was heading on at that time, or future professor, which was another possible path. What I really loved doing was looking at problems, either on campus or in Champaign-Urbana, where I went to college, and saying, how might we solve the problem? How might we solve the problem of, of homeless people being outside of circles of social and cultural capital? How might we solve the problem of uh, a lack of educational opportunities in the other side of the tracks? And I started to think of myself as a social entrepreneur. And perhaps just as importantly, I started to realize that all of the good things that we recognize that exist in America and around the world, right? Uh, the institution of nursing, the system of social service agencies, the system of college campuses, none of those things fell from the sky. Somebody built those things. And the first person who built them, who pioneered the model, was the social entrepreneur. And it was a whole new lens on the world. And I started to kind of look back in the history of institutions that I admired, sectors that I admired. And I asked myself, you know, who was the first? So Jane Addams and the role of social services in America. Jane Addams creates a settlement house in the 1880s, not half a mile from where my office is right now, and kind of is the social entrepreneur of a new way of, of meeting human needs in America, especially for immigrants. Florence Nightingale pioneers and patterns the way of taking care of people in hospitals, especially during war, that doesn't require a medical degree. She pioneers nursing. So I begin to kind of take that view into the world. Who are the, the individuals or combinations of individuals who are pioneering new patterns of solving social problems? And at the same time, I'm kind of recognizing that there's this social pattern emerging in the world that is equally pioneered by people, but it's a really ugly social pattern. That's the social pattern of religious conflict, right? So this is a time, uh, this is 1995, 1996, 1997. It's a time when Sam Huntington is writing The Clash of Civilizations, which is first an article on foreign affairs and then a book, which basically says that the new world order post-Cold War is going to be defined by people from different religious backgrounds at war with each other. Right? And on the evening news, even back then, there's news of the bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam in, in, in 1998 by Al-Qaeda. There's news of the bombings, uh, uh, there's news of the bombing of the USS Cole, again by Al-Qaeda. There's the bomb at the Atlanta Olympics by Eric Rudolph. There's the terrible shooting, which claims the life of Ricky Birdsong, the former Northwestern coach, basketball coach, by a young man named Benjamin Smith, following the ideology of the World Church of the Creator targeting African Americans, Asian Americans, and Jewish Americans in Chicago, Bloomington, and Champaign-Urbana. And I'm basically realizing that there is a, an, an animal in the world, an ugly animal, who's the social entrepreneur of contemporary religious violence. And one way to look at bin Laden is as the social entrepreneur who creates Al-Qaeda. One way to look at Eric Rudolph is as the social entrepreneur who creates religious bombings in America in the 1990s. Which, of course, gets me to think about the flip side of this. If there are individuals and combinations of individuals who are excellent at making religion a bomb of destruction and a barrier of division, if they are able to s analyze the problem in their whacked out way and create a solution to that, which is mechanisms of violence, are there not people who are or could be doing the other thing? Right? If, and to use a hackneyed term, if we want there to be bridges between people and communities who orient around religion differently, 
don't you need people to build those bridges? So around this time, I start getting into the work of Michael Walzer, great political philosopher. And one of the things that Michael Walzer points out in this beautiful book called What It Means to Be an American is that for generations, centuries actually, in the work of political philosophy, people think that you can only have diversity within an empire, that no, only a racially and ethnically, a religiously homogenous group of people would allow the other candidate to win, so to speak, and view it as legitimate, not react in violence. Walzer ends that section and goes to the next section, and he says this line, except in the United States, that America was the first nation to give rise to the idea that you could have diversity within a democracy. This is remarkable. It's unbelievably far from perfect, right? And yet still remarkable. The very idea that people from different communities from all over the world, speaking different languages, praying in different tongues, could come together to build a nation. We're the first country to give that a shot. And that doesn't fall from the sky or rise from the ground. There are people who create that. And what I start to think about is who are the people who have created the ecology of American religious pluralism, the identity category of those people. And I start to call them interfaith leaders. I want to give you a couple of examples of who those folks might be. So in the 1650s, uh, the governor general of New, what was then New Amsterdam, we now know it as New York, a man named Peter Stuyvesant, bans Quaker prayer meetings. He says that Quakers are rabble-rousers and seducers of the people. So when I was at Oxford, I would occasionally go to a Quaker prayer meeting. They don't even talk in these prayer meetings. They're silent. I mean, it, it's hilarious to think of these people as rabble-rousers and seducers of the people because you literally sit in silence and meditate on your own notions of God, which is one of the reasons I found those meetings so peaceful and beautiful. In any case, Stuyvesant bans Quaker prayer meetings. A group of people in what is now Flushing, Queens, mostly ordinary citizens, one or two of them a local council person, not a single one of them Quaker, comes together and writes a document called the Flushing Remonstrance. People call it the first stake in the ground for religious freedom in America, but actually it's much more beautiful than that, right? It's much closer to what Martin Luther King Jr. would one day call the beloved community. And there's language in this document that say things like, we believe the law of peace, love, and liberty should extend to all Jew, Turk, and Egyptian as they are all children of God. We are committed, and it lists a whole set of different religions. We are, we are committed to see in independence, Baptists, Quakers, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, something of the light of God in all of them. And they go and they present this remonstrance to Governor Stuyvesant, who, for their efforts, bans uh, half of them and throws a group of them into jail. That document, people hold up as the beginnings of religious pluralism in America. And you have to think to yourself, what if those people hadn't written it? It didn't fall from the sky, right? It didn't magically grow from a tree. People had to do it. In 1790, George Washington, first American president, new nation, right, receives a message from a man named Moses Sessions, who's the leader of the Hebrew congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, synagogue, the Turo Synagogue in Rhode Island. Part of what all this means is that the United States, America, even from before its beginnings as a nation state, was relatively religiously diverse. So people were struggling with these questions even at that time. Washington receives a message from this guy, Moses Sessions. And Sessions asks, basically, what's going to happen to my people in this country? He knows full well what's happened to Jews centuries, for centuries, especially in Europe, hounded and hated and harassed. What's going to happen in this new nation, the United States of America? Washington writes back in a document that I think that should be considered at the same level as the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the, the letter from, from Birmingham jail, one of the founding documents of this nation, writes back, this government will give bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance. May the children of the stock of Abraham sit in safety under their own vine and fig and let there be none to make them afraid. Ends the letter with this line, which is one of the epigraphs of, of, of the book Sacred Ground. May the Lord of all mercies scatter light and not darkness and make each of us 
useful in our vocations, each in his own way, and lead us to everlasting happiness in his way. And this is the document that people refer to over and over and over again. Michael Bloomberg refers to it during the Ground Zero Mosque Madness. Barack Obama refers to it. President after president, mayor after mayor, citizen after citizen, refers to Washington writing in this document that people of all faiths ought to have, and I quote, a like liberty. What if he'd never written it? Right? What if our first president had simply let the message from Moses Sessions pass? What different tradition, what other pattern might we have seen in America? A couple of other examples. One of my great heroes, Jane Addams. Now, I talked about her before as somebody who creates a leader who pioneers the pattern of social services in America. But frankly, I see her as much larger than that. During the late 19th century, as Jews and Catholics are pouring in from Eastern and Southern Europe, and the forces of prejudice are on the rise, right? Leaders of prejudice are on the rise saying, those people don't belong here. They're not Americans, they're strangers. Jane Addams builds an institution called Hull House on the near west side of Chicago, calling it a cathedral of humanity, and says those people aren't strangers, they're citizens. And America is based on the idea that we welcome the contributions of all communities and we nurture cooperation between them. One of the things I struggled with in writing Sacred Ground is, is how much do I present this notion of pluralism in America, which I think is deep in our bones, how much do I present it as part of the magic of American soil? And the truth is it's not, right? There's nothing inevitable about pluralism in America. There was, there's nothing inherent. There's nothing in this land that would make it a reality. It's just that we had, we were very fortunate to have, if you'll allow me to continue with the soil metaphor for a moment, the right gardeners at the right times, the right folks who faced the religious diversity of their moment and created out of it, not conflict, didn't forfeit that to the social entrepreneurs of prejudice, whether it's the Know Nothing Party or whether it's the Ku Klux Klan, but instead were interfaith leaders and looked at that religious diversity and were able to knit it together into interfaith cooperation or religious pluralism. So I want to take a moment to define interfaith leadership. And then I actually want to give a couple of more contemporary examples, if you will, right? Because I got to tell you something. Religious violence is not on the wane. Back in the 1990s, uh, I felt like I was one of the only people paying attention to, to that thread, right? That, wow, every time I turn on the news, there's a bomb going off to the soundtrack of prayer. Well, you don't have to be a genius right now to realize that this is one of the great issues of our time. It's one of the great issues of our, of our, of our time in America. Every time uh, um, a Muslim group wants to start a community center, are we going to be frozen in a national discourse of religious prejudice for three months, which is what happened around the quote-unquote Ground Zero Mosque or Cordoba House two years ago, right? Is that, is that going to be a pattern that we see continue for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? And if we finally get over that, are we going to see Confucianists, Hindus, Buddhists, Baha'is, atheists uh, uh, under that gun? It is clear to me that we have significantly powerful forces of prejudice in America right now. People who are entrepreneurial, people who are strong, people who are focused on saying some religious groups don't belong. They can't contribute, right? Those same forces in prior manifestations said that about Catholics, said that about John F. Kennedy in 1960 when he was a presidential candidate, said that every Catholic institution was a Trojan horse for papal rule inside. Part of what I do in Sacred Ground is I, I do this thought experiment. What would have happened if those leaders had won? There are 600 Catholic hospitals in America. There are 7,000 Catholic grade schools and high schools, one of which my friend Molly knows well, a young Zaid Patel as a preschooler wreaked a significant amount of havoc in on the north side of Chicago for the past two years. That's my son. And at ages three and four, he was a student at St. Matthias Catholic School. Somebody built that school. And there were a whole set of people against that school being built, saying this is a place where children will be trained to fly the flag of the Pope. American civil society is literally unimaginable 
without the presence and contribution of Catholic civic institutions. You could say the same about Lutheran institutions. You could say the same about Methodist institutions. It was Methodists who founded Northwestern University. As new religious communities gain critical mass and prominence in America and want to contribute their own institutions, their Cordoba houses, their Tibet societies, is American civil society going to be able to welcome them? I think that has everything to do with whether we have a critical mass, a generation of interfaith leaders who are powerful enough, who are focused enough, who are able enough to defeat the very strong, very entrepreneurial forces of prejudice of our times. So what's an interfaith leader? Very simple. An interfaith leader is somebody with the framework, the knowledge base, and the skill set to take people who orient around religion differently and build understanding and cooperation between them. I'll repeat that because it's kind of a geeky definition. I'm kind of a geeky guy. There you go. An interfaith leader is somebody with the framework, the knowledge base, and the skill set to take individuals and communities who orient around religion differently and build understanding and cooperation between them. It's particularly challenging in our day and age for a couple of reasons. I think three in particular. Number one, we're in this discourse, we're still in this clash of civilizations framework, right? And every time we turn on the evening news, it's another illustration, another story in that framework. Oh, wow, look at, the, look at what's happening with Sunnis and Shias in Bahrain. Look at what's happening with Muslims and Jews in the Middle East. Look at what's happening with, with whoever and whoever, wherever. It always feels like religious communities are at each other's throats. It's another affirmation of the most powerful foreign policy paradigm of our time, the clash of civilizations. The second major discourse of our time that the work of interfaith leadership is working against is this discourse of religion poisons everything. That's the subtitle of Christopher Hitchens' book, God is Not Great. But there's a huge group of writers, this new strain in atheism and humanism, which considers itself not orienting toward religion differently, but hostile towards religion. My friend Adam just, just walked in, which reminds me to say that it's, it's very important to point out that I don't think this is the majority of atheism or the majority of humanism. I don't think it's the, by numbers, but it's clearly a powerful voice. And I think that that's one of the frameworks with, with, within which people view religion right now, is they see things blowing up to the soundtrack of prayer, and it's very possible to say, yeah, Hitchens got it right. Religion poisons everything, right? The third major discourse that we're working against is the Muslims are coming to get you discourse. Probably first advanced by Bernard Lewis in, uh, the, in uh, uh, the Roots of Muslim Rage, uh, dramatically enhanced by people who want you to believe in Muslim rage, namely the Bin Ladens and Zawhiris and Zarqawis of our era. Right? But this notion that uh, not only do we live in a clash of civilizations, we live at a time when a particular religious community that happens to make up a fifth of the human family is against everyone else. And they're willing to use any, any means at their disposal. A big part of what interfaith leaders have to do is kind of a leadership jujitsu around these three discourses. People easily default to religion poisons everything easily default to faiths are fated to fight, easily default to, well, that's just what Muslims do. Look, you and I, I, I work in the world of interfaith cooperation, which means I'm around like, you know, sunshiny folks like Adam a lot who like want to think good things about religion. And we hear 25 times a day, religion can only do these ugly things. These are the frameworks, the discourses, the paradigms that people default to, right? People ask me all the time, but how can you work with a group of evangelicals who only want to convert you? And I'm like, who says they only want to convert you? And people, before they realize I'm Muslim, they're like, they're like but how can you work with the Muslims who only want to kill you? And I'm like, my full name is Ibrahim. Let me tell you the religious lineage of that name, and then I'll give you a chance to re-ask the question, and we'll just pretend you didn't ask the first question. What do interfaith leaders have to do? They have to find resonances, commonalities amidst paradigms that are conflict-oriented that people easily default to. Let me tell you one of my favorite stories about this. Anybody in here familiar with a woman named Ruth Messenger? Okay. She's one of, my, one of my great heroes. 
doesn't surprise me that Professor Goodman is familiar with her. I think one of the great leaders in America. She, uh, a, a very progressive New Yorker and Jewish woman who ran for mayor of New York uh, 10 or 12 years ago, now leads an organization called the American Jewish World Service. So she's kind of a mentor to Interfaith Youth Corps. Every once in a while, she'll come in and she'll do a talk for our staff. And uh, she came in about a year ago, and somebody said, tell us why you think interfaith cooperation is so important and how you got your start. Because what, what Ruth is primarily known for is progressive politics and kind of liberal theology and an institution building around that. And she told a very different story about her start in this work. She had just gotten her master's degree, Jewish woman from New York, 1960s, moves to Oklahoma, takes a job with the state government of Oklahoma. And it's a job that is meant to help especially the uh, children, uh, Native American orphans find foster homes. Okay. So she's traveling Oklahoma, working for the government, and she finds that her best allies in this work are Southern Baptists in Oklahoma. And I'm like, did you go to their Sunday church services and talk about the importance of foster care? And she's like, yeah, but mostly I went to their Wednesday morning front porch services and their Thursday afternoon backyard services because that's what religion was like in Oklahoma, then and now. And I'm like, but didn't you have all these differences with these people? And she was like, of course. But the purpose of what I was trying to do was get Native American orphans foster families. And I thought to myself, I disagree with these people on the choice life issue. I disagree with these people on whether women should be working outside the home. I disagree with these people on uh, whether women should get master's degrees, on the role of government in life. But the conversation I chose to have was the conversation about how we get Native American orphans foster families. And when I was able to weave the conversation back to that point, you know what happened? We found a lot of foster families for a lot of orphan kids. It's an exceptional example of interfaith leadership. Right? Because she found the conversation that they were able to have together that was a broader service to the world. I think to myself, there are a lot of other conversations Ruth Messenger could have chosen. A big part of what interfaith leaders do is they choose the conversation of commonality, of cooperation. I'll tell you a story about uh, a guy who is not particularly religious, but who taught me a lot about interfaith leadership. And that's my dad, and it happened really early in my life. So my dad went to Notre Dame University, uh, Muslim Indian immigrant, uh, in the land of gray snow and white Catholics in the mid-1970s, right? Uh, um, his huge bod on campus was fighting Irish football, um, which I have been deeply stained in myself, I must say. It's been a good season. And when I was a kid, eight or nine years old, my dad would take me in I-90 out of Chicago to South Bend, and we'd go to Notre Dame football games. And our first stop would be at the Grotto, which is this shrine to the Virgin Mary, right, at Notre Dame. And... Uh, at some point, I had this realization, I'm like, aren't we Muslim? What the hell are we doing, you know, lighting a candle at this Catholic shrine? And my dad puts his arm around me and says, there is a line in the Quran which says that God is like a lamp placed in a niche. God is light upon light. Always look for the resonances. Always look for the resonances. The reason that interfaith leadership is so important in this day and age is that people default to the conflicts. Those are the brightest discourses of our time. So if we're going to have an era in which the forces of pluralism defeat the forces of prejudice, we're going to have to have a critical mass of people who are exceptional at building understanding and cooperation amongst people who orient around religion differently people who have an appreciative knowledge of other traditions, people who know the theology and ethic of interfaith cooperation in their own tradition. So when somebody says, well, you know, hating Jews is a Muslim thing to do, or hating Muslims is a Christian thing to do, it says, actually, you're getting the Quran wrong. You're getting the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, wrong. 
It's actually a Quranic, a Muslim, an Islamic thing to do, to be in partnership with Jews. A knowledge of the theology of interfaith cooperation in your own tradition, right? It's just part of the knowledge base of interfaith leadership. And there's a skill set. People want to default to the conversation around conflict. It's a skill to lead them to the conversation of commonality. It's a skill to lead them to where's the resonance, right? And to do it in a way that doesn't say, gosh, you're a bigot, or gosh, you don't know anything. To do it in a way that feels like a dance, to do it in a way that's beautiful. One of the things we talk a lot about at Interfaith Youth Corps is interfaith leadership as a craft. What do we mean by it as a craft? It means that it's something to make beautiful. The stories we tell, the scripture we cite, the heroes we raise up, the moments in history we highlight, all of those things are to be made beautiful. We're engaged in a craft, a craft of stitching together a fabric of a highly religiously diverse civil society in a world in which a lot of other people want to tear it apart. A couple more things and I'll finish. Our work is entirely in college campuses, entirely with college students. Okay, why? Well, one reason is that just as I had that experience with that article about social entrepreneurship when I was, whatever, 20 years old, and it became a part of how I understood who I would be in the world, a part of my identity, a piece of my vocation, Part of our theory is that you all are making those decisions about who you are right now. You know, one of my favorite stories about this, a very telling story, is uh, I, I knew a, a, a woman at Yale who, uh, was, who worked in their, in their chaplaincy uh, as, as, as an interfaith person. And she said to me, gosh, I just I don't know how I'm going to continue this when I go on to Harvard Medical School. And I thought to myself, what an awesome place to be an interfaith leader. What other place in our society are Muslim and Jewish doctors cooperating to save the lives of Christian and Hindu and humanist patients every day, all the time? Right now, there are five surgeries happening at Northwestern Hospital where doctors from different religious backgrounds for whom their religion likely played a role in them deciding to become doctors are saving the lives, are cooperating together to save the lives of people from different religions, right? Part of what an interfaith leader does is has the framework and the ability to see that cooperation taking place and tell that story, precisely so that people don't believe in the inevitability of conflict. So if you're pre-med, if you're pre-law, if you're heading on to business school, if you're going to be a teacher, I promise you, you're going to be dealing with religious diversity. And I promise you, you are going to live in a world in which your patients, your students, your fellow lawyers, your customers are watching all the time religion as a bomb of destruction or a barrier of division. People are going to be bringing up with you in quotidian and offhand ways all the time those matters about religion. Will you have the appreciative knowledge? Will you have the theology of interfaith cooperation, the skill set to build understanding and cooperation? Right? A big part of what we're trying to do is to say part of the definition of being educated you graduate college, you ought to have some interfaith leadership knowledge and skills. And instead of you, I hope, decide that this is going to be actually what you want to do. I was with uh, Professor Robert Orsi, who's an, uh, uh, a senior professor in um, the, the Department of Religion, and he was like, you know, what's the vocational purchase of this? What do, if people Let's say they major in religion and they concentrate in interfaith leadership, or they take a class in interfaith leadership, or they go to an interfaith youth core interfaith leadership institute. What are they going to do when they graduate? And I think to myself, I promise you, Michael Bloomberg wished he had interfaith leadership experts on his mayoral staff during the madness of Cordoba House. And I promise you that mayors in cities all over the country, as they see mosques being blocked and people saying uh, all kinds of ugly, whacked out stuff about Islam and them looking at their staffs and being like, we know this is wrong, but does anybody know why it's wrong or have any counter knowledge? And they're all like, no, right? I promise you, everyone from mayoral staffs to religious denominations to the State Department and Madeleine Albright said during the Camp David negotiations between Arafat and uh, Ehud Barak uh, at the end of Clinton's second term, she says, I think we could have gotten there if I had as many interfaith experts on my staff at the State Department as I had economic experts. 
a big part of what we do at Interfaith Youth Corps is we say, this ought to be a part of who you are as a college student, period. And some of you might want to consider making a career of it. One of the things I love about college campuses is that there is this whole group of people, a whole set of people who are paid to help you make your ideas a reality. Dr. Tim Stevens, chaplain, is one of those people. He's sitting right there, right in the back, right? And he runs an interfaith leadership program on this campus where, what is it, 8, 10, 12 students get fellowships to be interfaith leaders. So I have to tell you, one of the most disorienting things when I first graduated from college was I was like, where are all the people who are telling me how great my idea is and that I can get student government money to like create a project from it, right? There's no place on the planet where something goes from idea to reality as fast as a college campus. So you are in one of Adam Goodman's leadership classes. And maybe, consider this a nudge, he teaches a module on interfaith leadership. Or you're in Tim Stevens' interfaith fellowship. And you get this idea, right? Or you're in one of Bob Orsi's classes about Catholic uh, civic institution and American civil society, or Catholics in the labor movement, or Catholics and Jews in the labor movement. You get this idea, you know, we could run this great interfaith project at Northwestern. And you come home that afternoon, and you talk to a friend of yours, and he's like, you know what, we've been talking about that in our InterVarsity Christian group. And you run into your roommate who's Jewish, and she says, you know what, actually Hillel has this interest in interfaith leadership. And the next day you run into your RA, at breakfast in your residence hall, and your RA is a Muslim, and your RA is like, you know what? The MSA at Northwestern has been focused a lot on this idea of, of interfaith cooperation, right? And your RA says, you know, we have some floor funds to help you make this happen. And by the way, I'm sure we could get like four faculty on this campus to serve on a panel about, say, how their religion speaks to mercy. And by the way, that new Center for Civic Engagement up there, they care a whole lot about students creating projects and making them happen, not just on this campus or in this city. So maybe we bring in Dan Lewis and uh, uh, Molly and Rob, and maybe we have them help shape a project out of this. And literally, in two weeks, you could go from being in Bob Orsi's class to having the money for a panel discussion in your dorm to two weeks later being in Dan Lewis and Adam Goodman's office at the Center for Civic Engagement with an actual project. And then 12 years later, you could be like, have I been running this organization for 12 years? How the hell did that happen? Which is basically my life. But that's a different book and a different story. I want to tell a final story, which is about my alma mater. Um, my friend Adam just walked in about 15 minutes ago and it reminds me of what they were able to pull off at the University of Illinois, right? Which is the kind of stuff you guys are already pulling off at Northwestern. So, uh, a guy named Greg Damhorst, who is profiled in this book, I think is an exceptional example of a young evangelical student who views part of his Christian work in the world as conversion and part of it as cooperation and says, listen, there are appropriate times to do each one of these, right? Uh, he is key in a student group at the University of Illinois called, Adam, what was it called again? Interfaith in Action. And every two weeks, Adam and Greg and Haymong and... Um, Nick Price and this group of students at U of I, every couple of weeks they'd get together and they would have a conversation about uh, religion and a shared value, mercy, compassion, hospitality. And you know, typical student group, 12, 15, 18 students would show up to this. And every year they would have their big event, uh, a day of interfaith youth service. We now at Interfaith Youth Corps call it part of a, a Better Together campaign. Back then it was called the Day of Interfaith Service. And they would have 100 or 150 students from different religious student groups on campus and other student groups as well. And they'd put them in religiously diverse groups and put them in vans and send them off to the Salvation Army or the Men's Emergency Shelter or the Women's Shelter, places that I used to volunteer and work when I, when I was down in Champaign-Urbana. And then they would have them do interfaith conversations afterwards. Again, kind of a typical student group, right? Um, and they would do this year after year after year. And because of the madness about religious diversity and religious violence on the news, vice chancellors and even the chancellors started to pay attention to this. It was really important. And folks in the community thought it was seriously important. A couple years ago, a terrible earthquake in Haiti happened, right? And we're talking about tens of thousands of people dead and hundreds of thousands of people homeless. And Greg and Adam have this really big idea, which is, they know all the theory about the role religious social capital plays in America, and they have a little bit of experience 
in Interfaith in Action, monthly meetings and annual days of interfaith service, and they think to themselves, what if we were able to mobilize thousands of people and pack dry goods meals of a million meals for Haiti, right? And they start talking to the folks they know. And somebody in Champaign says, hey, we can get you a venue for this. And somebody else says, that's a great idea, but you're going to need a federal grant to make it happen. And Greg's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, maybe we shouldn't. And the person's like, we can help you get a federal grant. And the chancellor and the vice chancellors are like, we got to do this. You know, this is what the University of Illinois is all about. And they mobilize 5,000 people over the course of a weekend, and they package over a million meals for Haiti. And there's this beautiful wall where people write in marker their faith, ethical, humanist, national, etc., inspiration to serve. Why do I tell you that story? Because, you know, in kind of classic Jim Collins way, Jim Collins is a, a, a great theorist of how you build great organizations. His line on this is, you just turn the flywheel, right? You start your interfaith leadership thing here, and you have your monthly meetings, and 15 people come up, and you do your annual event, and 100 people show up, and it doesn't feel all that earth-shattering, but you're learning how to do it. You're practicing your interfaith leadership skills. You are building your interfaith leadership knowledge. You run into problems. You figure out how to solve them. And folks around at Northwestern, President Shapiro loves the idea of interfaith leadership. Folks in Evanston, folks in Chicago start to pay attention. And then something terrible happens or something great happens. And you think to yourself, this is the time to go big. And you have the connections and you have the skills and you have the track record to go from 20 people in a dorm room talking about mercy and Islam and Christianity and 100 people on the quad during a day of interfaith service to 5,000 people in a million meals for Haiti. I got to tell you something. Everything beautiful was built that way, right? Everything beautiful was built by somebody at some point having this small idea and just turning the flywheel. I'll end with, uh, with the way Buddhists talk about this, right? Which is what, is when I talk about, you know, how do we get the interfaith core to be huge and scale and everybody an interfaith leader? And my Buddhist friends put their hands on my shoulders. They're like, hey, man, chop wood, carry water. Chop wood, carry water. Just do what you're supposed to be doing. Do it beautifully. Keep pushing it. Talk about the craft of this. Chop wood, carry water. A lot of leadership theory in that. Thank you. Take about 30 minutes of Q&A. Uh, we're trying to take the conversation, so if you can speak up loudly. I'm not going to direct traffic. Ibu is going to recognize you, and we'll go from there. Stand up and tell me your name and what you do here. And uh, my name's Tim Garrett. I'm an uh, undergraduate studying the Middle East, uh, primarily in history. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, uh, so in your speech today, you were talking about the primary obstacles to an interfaith action being people. Uh, this idea of the factual civilizations, the idea of this idea that religion poisons everything, and this idea of just Islamophobia. And what, my reaction to that was just, I think that these ideas have actually existed for centuries and centuries. Regarding the fascist civilization, the idea that our society and the Orient are opposed to each other, we've got Rudyard Kipling 150 years ago writing, you know, East is East and West is West, and never shall a queen meet. When it comes to the idea that religion poisons everything, we've got Voltaire writing 200 years ago, just um, questioning from this thing, talking about the Catholic Church. And I think the idea of just Islamophobia, that you know, the West should be afraid of Islam, has existed in you know, fear of the church for at least 500 years. To what extent, then, if these ideas have been around for so many hundreds of years, why are they so relevant today, and what's making them? Are, are, are they more dangerous, or are they just more yeah. visible? So th thank you for that. So I, I think that, uh, that, first of all, I think that was a, a powerful and pithy analysis, and I appreciate the quick history lesson, especially on Rudyard Kipling, who I'd forgotten had said that, but I will use that in speeches in the future. Tim Garrett, okay, I will cite you in that. Um, so I think that visibility and danger are intertwined here. They are dangerous because of their visibility, their prominence, their salience, right? And so you have, so Islamophobia, uh, and this is, I opened the book with, uh, uh, um, I see some of, so I spoke at Northwestern last year, the Muslim Students Association, I see some of my friends here from there, um, invited me. And so part of what I had to do was to give a different speech this time. 
and the, the last time I spoke, I opened my talk with the story of, that opens the book actually, which is the story of Sheikh Hamza Youssef uh, calling me during the madness of the Ground Zero Mosque uh, uh, discourse in America and saying, actually, this is good, okay? Because a prejudice out in the open is much better than a prejudice hidden, especially when the prejudice exists in lots and lots of people and for reasonable justification that if what you know about Islam is what you see in the evening news, uh, which is a reasonable thing to do if you're not Muslim or you don't know Muslims personally, then what you see in the evening news is people killing people to, this, to, to Arabic prayer, right? Uh, but part of the point that he was making is that this is particularly salient and particularly visible now, and it's no longer quarantined to a small group of people. It's infecting lots of people. And that means those of us who believe in a different vision of the role of Muslims in our society or the relationships between Catholics and Muslims or evangelicals and Muslims have to be equally prominent and even more powerful. You see what I'm talking about? So because of the prominence and power of those discourses, those of us who believe in the narrative of pluralism have to raise the volume on that. You can't be a passive pluralist anymore. And there are other eras in American history or other moments when, honestly, you could be. You know? um, and, and I think the Ruth Messenger example is a really, really important one. I want to go back to that example again. right? She made a situational decision. She was not going to argue with those folks in Oklahoma about the role of uh, a woman in professional life or about the role of the state or about, uh, um, about pro-life and pro-choice issues. She was going to have a conversation with them about the importance of cooperating on foster care. And a big part of what I'm saying is, I think, an extremely important conversation for us to be leading in our society is the conversation about cooperation between people from different faiths. So here's what people ask me all the time. But what about the differences? And part of what my response is, is in other eras, at other moments, when the clash, of, the clash of civilizations was less prominent, if the Muslims are coming to let, get you discourse was less loud, I would, I might very likely say it's an, it's an interesting conversation to have evangelical views of heaven and Muslim views of heaven. Right now, I think the most important conversation to have is what evangelicals and Muslims can cooperate on to do together. Because there's lots of people out there who think there's nothing evangelicals and Muslims can do together. So I think that part of this is situational. And I think that part of, this doesn't mean that pluralism isn't always important. It just means that pluralism is sometimes in more danger than at other times. Right now, it's in danger. And so leaders who step up and who take the mantle of pluralism, I think are, th that is hugely important. I'm going to put a footnote on this, right? Um, and I'm, I'm actually I'm preparing a talk to do at Harvard Divinity School in a couple of weeks called uh, New Rooms in the House of Religious Pluralism, Evangelicals and the Interfaith Movement. And part of the point that I'm making in that talk is that interfaith work is dominated generally by three groups of people. By the way, categories I, put, I would put myself in. Politically progressive, theologically liberal, and focused on spiritual enrichment. Right? I think these are important movements. However, to the extent that they cut out those of conservative politics, conservative theologies, people who are more comfortable articulating spiritual limits. I think it's bad right now. That is a very nerdy way of saying, Adam has heard, heard me say this a lot, that right now I privilege the discourse of pluralism over other discourses that I think are important. I happen to be politically progressive. When I meet with uh, a conservative Republican evangelical, I don't have a political conversation. I have a conversation about cooperation. Because I think that the relationship between evangelicals and Muslims, in my view, is more important than a hashing out of political differences. That was a very like interfaith 410 thing to say. You can see that I'm kind of working out my own thoughts on that. And this is part of the beauty of being at Northwestern. I can say interfaith 410 thing, things to you. And you can ask me the follow-up questions, which you are about to ask me, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm Alexander. I'm also an undergraduate. I was wondering what you think is the role of criticizing non-specific religious people or institutions, but 
specific beliefs, especially to the extent that they're having like an immediate impact on social issues, like you you brought up this yeah. pro-life, pro-choice, which is something that's being discussed in this election. You know, there's talk of trying to um, get rid of Roe v. Wade and things like that. And if someone comes and presents the view that you know we should do this because the fetus has a soul, this is a very specific religious doctrine that can, I'm sure comes from different religions and people might have this belief, but to what extent do you think yeah. there's a time to say, like, you know what, you, you have this belief that yeah. we're talking about? That is a, I mean, that is a perfect follow-up to, to my little soliloquy, so thank you for that. So um, here's, I want to I go back to my premise here. Clearly, there's, you, one can argue with this, but my premise here is that American society rests on relationships between diverse communities and people who orient around religion differently. It, it also it, it, it orient around a variety of identities differently, right? Religion is particularly salient at this time. Without a sensibility in our society that people from different religions can get along, can live in the same neighborhoods, can go to the same schools, can, um, can participate in Little League together in a very civic way, we're in really deep danger because American society is knit together that way. Now look, not all societies are knit together this way. If you go to other societies, people live in religious silos. I am personally deeply concerned about this. That's why I say that right now, I privilege the discourse of pluralism, which is to say, what do I have in common with you? What can we do together? Think back to the Ruth Messenger example. What can we do together <clears throat> over other discourses? That doesn't mean <clears throat> I give up my other identities, right? So again, I happen to be progressive. That's how I vote. That doesn't mean I don't vote because what I talk about on stage is the importance of pluralism. And that doesn't mean I don't vote progressively. I do, right? Uh, and that, that also doesn't mean if somebody asks me, I'm not willing to say it. I'm clearly not embarrassed about it. It's just not the most salient thing that I talk about, especially when I'm with particular groups of people. I never hide it, but I don't lead with it, right? Our language at Interfaith Youth Corps is lead with pluralism. Here's part of the reason for that. Because it, first of all, there are plenty of people out there Part of the point that I want to make is there are plenty of people out there who are fighting those other battles. It doesn't make the battles any less important, but part of what I want to submit to you is there are far fewer people who are skilled in and committed to the, the relational issue, who are able to do what Ruth, Ruth Messenger did and say, I'm going to put, I'm going to deprioritize these for this conversation. I'm going to build a relationship right now. And by the way, that relationship is going to make that other conversation feel different. So here's what I would submit to you, right? To take the Middle East example, um, people say to me all the time, you know, how come the, as an American Muslim, the Middle East is not like at the center of what you talk about, right? It's the elephant in the room. And I'm like, I'll tell you why, because there are other animals in the zoo. That's why. And the more you talk about the elephant in the room, the more every animal starts to look like an elephant. Practically speaking, to move out of the zoo for a second. What concerns me most about putting divisive issues at the center of relationships is that it creates a tone that all we can ever do is be divided. And part of the promise of putting relational issues, I'll tell you how that's played out vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East conflict, but also the pro-choice, pro-life issue, is it goes from, I disagree with you on A, B, and C politically. You are a terrible person. You come from a poison tradition, right? So you go from divisive conflict and you read it into who that person is, what that community is, and what that tradition is about. And then all of a sudden, you have found yourself in a well that is so deep, it's hard to dig out of it. And this is my deepest concern about the Middle East stuff, right? At some point, somebody's gonna draw the line somewhere in the Middle East. And then it's gonna take two generations for them to unstitch every stitch that they have stitched of hatred over the last two generations and restitch cooperation. And how many miles is it 
from the Mediterranean to the Jordan? 70? We're not talking about a big patch of land. We're talking about a really small territory, a territory where people are honestly going to have to work together. Right? So my direct response to your question is, I think that it actually is engages a highly important issue, which is the division between people from different identity backgrounds, to, in, to focus on that. But it also puts in a warmer light the divisive issues. right? And the, the kind of colloquial way of saying this is that it humanizes your interlocutor. And I, my, my sense is, and you guys would frankly know this better than I would, but there's probably a bunch of research on this. Like, honestly, like what happens in the brain when you, Jonathan Haidt's book, um, uh, on, you know, uh, on uh, why good people are divided over religion and, and, and politics probably has stuff on this, which is what happens in the brain when you're arguing with somebody versus when you choose to have the conversation about resonance and literally the kind of neural pathways that are lit up and then how you can move from that to a more divisive conversation but have it in a different way. Final thing I'll say about this is that here's the crazy thing to me about age-old divisions, pro-life, pro-choice, Middle East stuff, is people have the same argument in the same way and think that they're going to get something different out of it, right? And, and like, you know, neither my Muslim friends nor my Jewish friends are crazy when I say this, but I, anytime something crazy happens in the Middle East, my... Char what, what I accuse them of is dusting off the press release they wrote in 1981, putting new dates and names in and sending it out. And I'm like, what has that gotten you from 81 to 2012? So why the hell are you doing it again? Why don't you try to have the conversation in a different way? That doesn't mean you change your position. It just means you try to talk about it differently. And maybe something different will happen. Because the only thing anybody ever agrees on about the Middle East is that it gets worse. So if the only thing you agree on is that it gets worse, but you keep on doing the same thing, you know, that's the definition of insanity at some level. Partially answered this, I guess as introduced, but uh, Nate Matthews on the history department. You partially answered this question, so my apologies if I'm kind of uh, going over a uh, ground you already covered. And, and I, I, I agree with almost everything that you've said tonight, and, it, and it's been tremendously- it's dangerous. Yeah, but it's, it's been tremendously inspiring to, to hear, but, I, I am still left wondering uh, about those who have serious and profound um, orthodox theological commitments to the idea that um, I am part of an exclusive faith that has an exclusive truth to communicate to the rest of the world. Um, in other words, you can find in, in, in all of our faith traditions very potent ideas for working together, but you can also find very potent ideas that uh, the, the enemy, the outsider, the other should be torched and burned and killed. Um, the Old Testament is replete with these types of, uh, of, of images. <clears throat> so with somebody who has these kind of orthodox theological commitments and who is not uh, theologically progressive or theologically liberal, how do they approach this and yet still keep the integrity of their holy scripture? Is this, is this a, a problem that's sort of unique to Abrahamic scriptural faith, or is it, or is it part of a larger uh, yeah. a human problem, or what would you say? So, I mean, profound question. Thank you for that. So I want to separate a couple things, right? I want to separate orthodox, I want, I want to separate orthodox theological belief, and, so, and let's just for the moment associate that with exclusive truth claims, right? Uh, I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. You understand that literally. I believe that Jews are the chosen people. I believe that uh, unless you pray in Arabic this way and take the Shahada, you're not going to heaven, right? Um, I want to separate that from people who raise the volume on the scripture within traditions that say dash their children against the stones or kill the Jews wherever you might find them. Because I don't think those are the same thing at all. Right? So, so I want to I answer, I think you're asking two questions, both of them are important, and if you let me be nerdy for a second, I'll, an, I'll answer both of them. So here's, here's the way I think we deal, that we deal with orthodox theological belief, and by the way, I think, I think everybody at some level 
believes that their way of believing or thinking is better than other ways. I think that's just the deal. Like, welcome to reality. Welcome to human reality. Welcome to interfaith work. Welcome to your math class, right? There are people in your math class who think you are going to hell. You might be one of the people who thinks that other people are going to hell. That's just reality. And the way we deal with that in interfaith youth core is we separate heaven and earth. And we say, what people think about heaven is important, but it is not the primary concern for a civically engaged interfaith effort. That doesn't, that, so there's two things we are not doing which are very important. Number one, we're not telling those people or we people, right, uh, that those beliefs are wrong. We're saying they're totally precious. They're, and, and we recognize how important those are to you. They're just not what we do in this setting. Okay. Um, the second thing that we do is create a setting where those other ways, th those other dimensions of belief, those other dimensions of a tradition are not talked about as stupid or archaic, which happens all the time in interfaith circles. And I frankly find it offensive, right? People who are of liberal theological bents, which I am also, who like to use interfaith spaces as places to be derogatory towards people who are more conservative theological bents. What I think the interfaith space is, is a place where people who say, I am inspired by some dimension of my tradition to come and cooperate with you. There are other dimensions of my tradition which might require me to try to convert you. There are other dimensions of my tradition where I pray for your soul. There are dimensions of my tradition in which I don't think you're going to the same place with me after we die. I just think that's reality. And I, I, I think we have to recognize that religious traditions are complex and have multiple dimensions, and what we are doing is raising the volume on the dimension that says cooperation. But we are not totalizing that. You know, we're not saying that you have to believe, uh, you have to believe that your entire tradition is about cooperation. One of the things I like to say is if you think that 1% of your Christian belief is cooperating with the Muslim, I want to work with you in that 1%. And I'm perfectly willing to recognize and honor the other 99%. And we can talk about that at other times. In the interfaith space, I want to work on that 1%. Right? It's a civic project, if you will. Now, there's a theology to that cooperation, but it's not the, it's not the only theology we expect people to have. On, on the other question of what people do with those other scriptures, you know, I, th I think that there's, I think that the number of people in the world who feel moved to act on the dimensions of scripture, which say things like dash their children's heads against the stones, which is the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, or kill the unbelievers wherever you might find them, which is the Quran, or the Bhagavad Gita, which is basically a story of a warrior saying, I don't want to fight, and God, in the form of Krishna, descending from heaven, saying, you're required to fight, is people find ways of de-emphasizing those stories or creating theologies in which those stories are historically located. Or, in the case of Gandhi and the Bhagavad Gita, they view it as a metaphor for something else not for violence, right? And frankly, most of us do that because if you are a religious believer and you have that scripture, you have to find out, you have to find something to do with it instead of acting on it. So in the case of, you know, kill the unbelievers in the Quran, what Muslim scholars would say is it was a message for a very particular historical moment and it wasn't meant to move beyond that, right? Um, what Gandhi does with the Bhagavad Gita, I find fascinating. But I, I, I don't, I think that the first question you asked about orthodox religious belief and exclusive truth claims is a, is a naughtier question. We, get a, we engage it by saying, of course believe that, and also believe this, because it's part of your tradition, and let's create a space where that other cooperative belief, if you will, is made salient. Doug, salam alaikum, man, nice to see you. Uh, I wish I was. Um, I, I have a question. Uh, this is uh, part two of a question I asked you years ago uh, at the very lovely uh, Presbyterian Church on Michigan Avenue. And it's about um, uh, an interfaith of integrity. Uh, you started your talk out 
with the uh, very eloquent letter that um, George Washington wrote to a uh, rat on it. And as I uh, hear that, as touched as I was by that, I couldn't help but think about here's a man who owned a huge plantation yeah. of slaves. Yeah. So uh, the work that he was yeah. doing, or the elevation that he was doing with the Jewish community, um, to me, uh, it's undone by the huge plantation that he owns. So how do we cultivate a uh, sense of integrity uh, when we're doing interfaith work? So that um, the eloquence that we're writing to one group is not, we're not being blindsided by the bondage for keeping up Yeah. So thank you for that. And actually, I, I write about that directly in the book because, you know, here I am quoting all this Washington. And I quote a bunch of other stuff. The, you know, the letter that he writes to his generals during the, the colonial war where he, he bans the practice of burning the Pope in effigy, this unbelievably ugly anti-Catholic practice. And he says, we have to welcome these people into the colonial army, right? They're soldiers coming from Maryland. They're fighting for the cause. And I'm writing, I'm studying all this, and I'm writing all about this, and then I'm like, you know, and, and there's this beautiful letter that George Washington writes uh, about, about um, people at, uh, uh, who he, workmen at Mount Vernon, his estate, and he says, I don't care if they're Jews or Mohammedans or non-believers, as long as they can do the work. And then the next section I, I go to in the book, in Sacred Ground, is, and of course, those Jews and Muslims and non-believers worked alongside Washington slaves. Right, so we have there's we have to deal with that, and we have to deal with the Native American question, right? And and the fact that that American marginalization questions continue, no doubt. This is not a consistent and coherent and easy story to tell, right? And it's not like uh, uh, the forces of prejudice have always been on the outside. They have, you know, uh, uh, with some frequency been been in the White House, especially in the in the early days. So. Here's what I, I find in this is, is particularly civil rights era African American responses to American prejudice, I believe, are the, the second key pillar of pluralism in America, right? So if the first key pillar is the vision, tainted as it is, by slavery and genocide of Native Americans. The second key pillar, I think, is the response of especially African Americans to their experience. And, and to just use language much more eloquent than I could ever write Langston Hughes, America never was America to me. Yes, I, uh, but, oh yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, but I declare this oath, America will be. Right? So this decision, this belief, within the leadership of the African-American community that America was not a lie but a broken promise and worth fixing, worth fighting for. And I, I genuinely believe that, that the American project could very easily have fractured had Baldwin, Langston Hughes, Martin Luther King Jr., and that the lineage you know, before and since not been hyper-articulate about that, and given their bodies and their their blood, to help fix to help fix it, right? So what they're saying is, we believe in the American ideal of pluralism. The circle has to include us, and it's never included us. And this is King's rhetoric throughout, which I find so inspiring, right? You know, he talks about not the African American dream over and over again, but the American dream in which African Americans ought to be included because of the contributions they've made and will make, right? Um, he talks about, in, in, you know, he talks about America writes a check that we are now going to cash. In other words, he's saying, I trust this thing, uh, and I'm going to work to try to rebuild it. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story, which I think you will, uh, you will appreciate. So a couple months after uh, uh, September 11th, my dad goes to this this dinner of a Muslim activist organization. And a uh, uh, Muslim speaker gets up and kind of pounds the podium and, and basically foresees the erosion of civil rights and the coming of Islamophobia and says, we need a Muslim civil rights movement in America. And the chief guest at the dinner is Jesse Jackson. And uh, Reverend Jackson has prevailed upon to speak, and he accommodates, he speaks, and he gets up there and, and his first line is, there's no such thing as Muslim civil rights. There are civil rights, and people who look like me 
fought for those civil rights for people who look like you and for everybody else in this country. And now that you're feeling the pinch of prejudice, you have a decision to make. Are you only going to talk about how bad it feels when you're sent to the back of the bus? Or are you going to join my movement, this bigger movement, and try to create a bus where nobody is sent to the back to, to the back of, right? What I find so powerful about that experience, and again, the kind of African-American path, is that there is, it would be easy, I think, for a set of communities, Latinos, LGBT folks, Muslims, whoever, to say, look at the ugliness we're experiencing in America. This thing is a lie. American dream is a lie. No such thing as the American promise. But what African Americans went through was at such orders of magnitude more terrible, and they still believed. I really think that plays a psychological role in the consciousness of people who are experiencing prejudice. <clears throat> and they're basically like, that's the path we're going to follow. We're not, we're not going to try to tear down American institutions. We're not going to say this whole thing is a lie. We're not going to junk this thing. What we're going to do is say, we now have the opportunity to improve this thing, and not just for us, but for everyone, right? And uh, that's basically what, she, again, I opened the book with this call that Sheikh Hamza makes to me, and I say to him, look, I'm angry, I'm despairing, I can't believe what they're doing to Cordoba House and Imam Faisal and Daisy, and he's like, this isn't the time to despair. These are the moments that change agents yearn for. Our nation is molten and can be shaped. He was basically like, why do you think you get to drink from the same water fountain that other people do? Because leaders in other eras fought for that. And they fought for it at a time when prejudice against them was particularly visible, particularly ugly, particularly salient. That's the chance you have now as an American Muslim. right? Your interfaith movement, American Muslim identity, has an opportunity to be more visible precisely because the chief evil that it's combating is more visible. And that's a responsibility, and you have a choice of whether or not to take it. Right? So that's really the spark of this book. After my first book, I said to my wife, I'm like, never let me do that again, because it damn near ruined me. Right? And, but after that story from Sheikh Hamza and kind of the recognition that we inherit this legacy of interfaith cooperation in America, are we going to write the next chapter in it? That's how this next book comes into being. I think we have time for one or two more. Yes. My name is Bobby Ruby, and I had poli sci lectures in this room 50 years ago. That's what I did. Four years ago, 2000, when we were still getting 12 Republicans and eight Democrats in the primaries, we were being told by everybody, we can't talk to each other. We're too divided, et cetera. My husband and I tried an experiment, and we started talking to people about politics, not partisan. And over the next six months or so, our question was, if the, let's assume the person you think is most qualified, so we never even talked about who, uh, actually wins the election and gets enough space that in that you know, three months that we actually work together before we go around and each other again. Uh, we could actually get something accomplished. What do you think is most important? And we got the most interesting, thoughtful answers. We saw probably a third of the country. It happened to be my husband's um, reunion for high school, so people came back from all over the country. And we asked, we would just ask this. We asked people in McDonald's at 11 o'clock at night. I was waiting for his girlfriend. One of the most interesting conversations I had was at something like 6 in the morning in a motel with a man that turned out to be a prison guard. And we talked for probably an hour, and my husband came out, and we talked another half hour. And at the end of it, he said, we would probably go with the opposite on every single issue, and I can't think of a time I've had more fun than this conversation. So my first thing is, try it. It's fun, and it does work. And if you talk to your family that way, you shock us. My second is, can we do something similar with religious questions? Because religion is one of the most interesting things to talk about in the whole world. How come we're not getting a chance to do that? Thank you for that. So I think I'm just going to let that story stand on its own. I think it's a great example of, of, of um, choosing the relational question and the relational conversation in another very divided area of American life, which is politics. So I think we'll just take that as an inspiring analogy. Thank you. Uh, 
last question or two? Yeah. That sounds great. Uh, there, so I see one there. Is that it? There was a, so why don't we take two at the same time, and I'll answer them both. How about we do that? I'll answer the easier one, actually. No, I'm just kidding. So I am one of the interview advocates on Chaplin Stevens. I'm sorry. I'm one of the interview advocates on Chaplin Stevens. Oh, good. And Thanks so, for coming. Um, yeah. Just... I know that you said for proactive cooperation, you have to, um, you know, stress the commonalities between faith traditions. And one of the things that I'm struggling with right now in planning events for the program is that if I take that idea and I take it to the point um, where we're all affirming each other's identity and affirming each other's faith, like, is that a step too far? Yeah, that's a, so what a great question. That's, um, I love that. Thank you for that question. So I think a couple things here. Number one, um, we have to be able to talk about commonality in ways that aren't boring, right? And that's actually a huge challenge. You know, uh, I have two chapters in this book. One is called The Science of Interfaith Cooperation, where I kind of go through the recent social science data on it, and one's called The Art of Interfaith Leadership. And, and on, honestly, The Art of Interfaith Leadership boils down to a single line. Can you make it inspiring, right? And, and a big part of what we have to do as interfaith leaders is make it inspiring for people to talk about commonality. And Look, when Washington writes the letter to Moses Sessions, that's hugely inspiring, I think. The Flushing Remonstrance is hugely inspiring. So to have a knowledge base of those moments in history. I remember being in South Africa in 1999 in Cape Town, and Nelson Mandela standing up and saying, I wouldn't, you know, he, said, he pointed out to the Cape and said, I would still be on that island, Robben Island, where he spent 26 years of his life, if it wasn't for... Uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews and Hindus and African traditionalists and Baha'is working together in the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. Unbelievably inspiring, right? So those moments in, with interfa in which interfaith, and there's a hundred others. There's, there's Martin Luther King Jr. and what he did. There's, you know, uh, Niebuhr and Heschel. There's all these beautiful, inspiring moments. To know some of those, to be able to tell that story, I think is really, really important. How do you make commonality between religions inspiring in a way that's not just affirming, affirming everything? So I think that one of, the, one of the, the important threads here is talking about commonality is not, is not shaking hands about full agreement. What it really does is open the door to stories of particularity, which are, I think, the most interesting stories about religion. So major kind of methodology at Interfaith Youth Corps is you lift up a shared value like mercy. But the conversation isn't, you Jews believe in mercy? We Muslims believe in mercy? Great. We should just be one religion. The conversation is, tell me an inspiring story about mercy from your tradition. Right? Tell me an inspiring story about mercy in Judaism or Islam. What story inspires you the most? Right? And then you have all, you, you like, that tradition is wide open to you. And you can, I mean, there's this, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll give you an example of this, a story that, you know, is so beautiful to me, it always catches in my throat when I, when I tell it. So the story of, of um, when the Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him, puts together a caravan to return to Mecca so that uh, at a time when basically the Muslims have won and they've defeated the tribes that are against them, right? And he is returning to Mecca to, to, uh, do the, to do the circumambulations around the Kaaba, to do the Hajj, he sees a mile down the road a dog and her pups by the side of the road and knows that the caravan is going to run right over these dog and her pups. And he changes the route of the caravan so that they could live. Right? Such a beautiful story about mercy and such like a small story about mercy in Islam. But I'd love to think it's inspiring and it's interesting, right? And I think that that's what makes interfaith conversation. And, and, and then the, the, the question goes to, what's today's caravan going to run over? How do we change the route of today's caravan? So you go from a shared value to a set of particular stories and religious traditions. And one of the ways, you know, there's a bunch of people thinking, oh, I don't know any of those stories. I promise you, when people start telling stories, you'll start remembering stories. That's one of the most beautiful things about 
storytelling, is that the more people tell them, the more you'll remember your own, right? And then you ask the question, what are contemporary versions of this, and how do we create action projects out of it, right? Tell a final kind of little, little thing on this. Um, so I've been saying a lot about what interfaith leaders do is they shape conversations around commonality, around relationships, right? Away from hyper-divisive discourses. So I'll give you a great example of, of how I saw Bill Clinton do this. So I see Bill Clinton uh, facilitate a conversation between Shimon Perez and uh, Salam Fayyad, the Palestinian prime minister. Um, and he makes this joke. He says, there's somebody else in the Clinton family who is responsible for the diplomacy. He's like, I want to talk about the civil society. Okay. Here's my question. Once, once the line is drawn, and everybody knows it's going to be drawn at some point, once it's drawn, what models do you have within Israel or the Palestinian territories that are going to help you live together? And then he leads over, he's like, because you're going to have to learn to live together. So what models do you have? And it takes everybody aback, right? Because who's heard a question asked that way? Anytime you talk about the Middle East, it's like, bring out the brass knuckles. But here Clinton, with two major figures on each side of the divide, who are perfectly willing to scrap if you want them to, totally shifts the conversation. And they have to think really deeply, yeah, what models do we have of coexistence? And that's when Perez says, hospitals. Hospitals. There's still a place where people from different religions and backgrounds from both sides of the line come together for healing. We've managed to maintain sanity in our hospitals. Such a beautiful moment of interfaith leadership, I thought. OK, last question. I promise I'll be short. Thank you. What a great question. Adam, you know I'm going to call on you, man. Adam, Adam joined our staff about, I don't know, a year ago? Uh, three months. Three months? <laughs> You're making me go gray before my time. So Adam was part of the team at, at, uh, um, at the University of Illinois who did this great interfaith work and proud, kind of hyper-rational atheist on our staff at IFYC. Um, so I, I think atheists actually play a very key role in interfaith work um, because one of, one of the confusions that comes up is that idea of um, interfaith work. It's one of the big myths around it that atheist, I mean, that interfaith work um, has to do with people coming together and affirming each other's beliefs um, and pulling down. Oh, we all believe basically the same thing. Like, oh, we all believe in the same God, the same angels. Oh, isn't this beautiful, fantastic? Then you have an atheist kind of walk in. And all things kind of like get dashed aside, right? You're like, well, I don't believe in God. Well, I don't believe in angels. And so it, it really kind of brings innovation to its core, which is focusing on those shared values. So I actually believe atheists are a pivotal part of interfaith work and will do a really um, important job of um, setting the course and keeping it on course. And let me just add to that. Thank you for that. that I think that's exactly right. And probably 20% of the people in our programs and on our staff are atheists. So they just have an equal place at the table like everybody else. They speak from traditions of atheism or traditions of science. They tell stories. Some of the best interfaith leaders I know, I would put Adam in this category, are atheists. So they have an, an equal place at the table. Right? It's, it's, it, it, uh, it really is as simple as that. And when you're inside, it feels totally natural. Although, obviously, from the outside, it's like, so tell me how this all fits in. Right? Um, thank you very much. I'm going to leave you, just say again, especially to the folks who are, who are part of the Interfaith Fellowship Program, chop wood, carry water. Just keep doing it. it you'll get better at it, I promise. And uh, you know, it's awesome. I'm, I'm, it is really inspiring that it's happening. And Tim has been chaplain for 25 years. This is an inflection point in this movement, right? We're living, at a, we're living at a great time for doing interfaith leadership, partially because the forces of prejudice are strong, and partially because college campuses and people like Tim have been building this over a long, long time. And that means that those of us who come at the end of it get to kind of inherit it. Last little uh, kind of leadership thing. Um, uh, there's a great line in Martin Luther King Jr.'s work you know, about the importance of leadership. It's like the pendulum doesn't swing. You have to push it, right? It's not just going to naturally happen that pluralism becomes highly salient again. There's going to, be ha going to have to be a group of people who make it happen. So proud to spend the evening with you all who are doing that. Thanks.